morning, Ada. Good um, morning, Yvette. Can you tell us how you got to know Lucy Covington? I got to know lovely Lucy in Washington, D.C. when we were both working to assist our tribe who were both uh, victims of the termination policy. The Menominees were the first tribe terminated and we were the first tribe restored. And Lucy was in uh, the struggle to um, reverse the termination of her tribe, which was, I don't know if it was really finalized at that point, or but it was supposed to be, it was strong on the path. Maybe you can correct me on that. Well, the Colvilles were, they were, cons they were in the fight for ter on termination from 1956 to 1970. I see. And um, Lucy really worked to organize and bring together a group who could challenge the people who wanted to terminate the reservation. Mm -hmm. The council was split. 18 of the council, or excuse me, eight of the 14 council members wanted to sell the reservation. Mm -hmm. And they had convinced Congress to move forward. Can you tell us a little bit about your interactions with with uh, Lucy and the Congress? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, we didn't see each other a lot, but when we did, we had exchanged a lot of information. And when she explained to me how she was organizing uh, her tribe, it, it was uh, similar to our organization, um, but we were um, from the Midwest and we had a beautiful forest which is world famous. Uh, many people come to see our beautiful forest. And as a matter of fact, at the time, um, we learned that the uh, F Menominee Forest was uh, one of two areas uh, seen by the satellite. There was the Great Wall of China and the Menominee Indian Tribes wonderful forest. And I was very impressed with the leadership that uh, Lucy demonstrated, her compassion, her caring, her devotion, and her, her persistence and strong determination to uh, help her people. And it was very, uh, not only interesting, that's, um, a very weak word in, in this context, but it was very helpful to me to know that another woman was fighting the same policy that uh, I was fighting. But I want to say that th this whole termination um, uh, was not the Indian's idea, and it would take more time than we have here to go into this whole explanation of why it, what, why it happened. But usually at that point in time, the policies came down from Washington and then the tribes had to deal with these uh, decisions that they were not fully informed about, did not give their basic consent to. Now there's uh, a uh, anecdote about this that the, no, it's not an anecdote. It was um, interpreted as consent. Uh, we um, carried on a long lawsuit against the federal government for mismanagement of their trust responsibility. There was a big blowdown early in the history of the tribe, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs refused to allow the Menominees to harvest you know, many, many uh, aspects of the blowdown. And hundreds of board feet, well, I would say probably thousands of board feet were uh, just left lying in the forest to rot. And the reason that the BIA would not allow the Menominees to harvest it was because of the outside interests that would harm them. And of course, it's even infuriating to even think about that now, considering that we have a trust relationship with the federal government. And so uh, each Menominee was to receive $1,500 uh, as a result of that. The, the tribal people wanted to have some individual money 
rather than just putting the result of the lawsuit, which we won against the federal government. And so uh, the then Senator uh, Arthur Watkins came out to uh, our tribe. He was, a, he was a Republican from Utah. And he waived the $1,500 in front of the Menominees were very poor individually. And they thought that they were agreeing to accept the money. They did not understand that they were agreeing to uh, termination. And of course, many uh, entities also did not know what termination really was. Uh, the state government of Wisconsin, uh, the tribal people, and even the federal government, you know, they didn't understand. They, they wanted to uh, obey the federal government. At that time, the paternalism of the federal government was very strong. And they wanted to uh, help our people. So I took my $1,500, saved it for graduate school. My brother asked me uh, what I thought about him getting a car. So uh, my brother, Joe, he's two years younger than I. I said, Joe, you will get your car from some sleazy car dealer in Shano, which is the white town south of the res. Your car will be gone, your money will be gone, and you'll have nothing. So of course, why would he listen to his woman or his sister, a woman, telling him what to do, even though he asked me? Well, that's what happened, you know. So many of the people were extremely poor at that time, and so they spent their money. And um, when I was in Washington, um, lobbying for the Menominee Restoration Act, um, one of the senators on the committee said, well, we, th we understood that you all had agreed to this. I said, will you waive $1,500 in front of poor people? Uh, naturally, uh, they are uh, eager to receive the money. It was not an informed consent. And uh, that um, is very unfortunate. And I learned later on that the senator was really angry with me because I corrected him. And of course, that did not sit well with the senators at that time. So uh, Lucy explained what she was doing, organizing her people uh, and to uh, work against the termination. And, uh, there was an election and new people came on the tribal council and they worked strong and, and long and hard to reverse it. But Lucy was so articulate, so uh, devoted, so determined. And it was very uh, encouraging to me uh, to encounter her at that time because we were both fighting the same policy and we both actually won over time. So I think people need to know the hard work that it takes to reverse a federal policy. And I was recently called by the director, executive director of the University of Wisconsin Alumni Association. Uh, that was a year or so ago. And she said they were making an alumni park and she wanted to ask my permission to be included in that um, uh, work. And I said, wow, wow. You know, so we now have an alumni park. And she said, uh, and there are various people, there, there are over 400,000 graduates of the University of Wisconsin. And there was some process that they went through to f uh, approach people that they wanted to have in this park. And she said, you know, Ada, you're the first person I'm calling about this. I said, really? Oh, wow. And she said, uh, yes. And so she explained what they were doing. It was a parking lot, and they wanted to transform it into a, a park. And so she said, I was reading about you. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> and she said, I liked what you said. Of course, now I'm a very talkative person, and I have an opinion about everything and everybody. And so I said, well, what did I say? Well, she said it was a very strong statement. And it said, if there's a federal law in your way, change it. So I would have also said, if there is a law in your way, change it.
because there are many laws that are passed that affect American Indians. So at any rate, uh, there I am permanently ensconced uh, with my quotation in the University of Wisconsin-Madison Alumni Park. And I'm certain that there are certain um, remembrances of uh, Lucy uh, around the nation and also at her tribe. But I actually um, don't know for sure. Maybe you can tell me. Well, L Lucy went on um, once they sort of changed the tide and changed the tribal council from a minority to a majority. They moved forward with self-determination mm -hmm. and trying to preserve and protect and advance the tribal sovereignty of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know that her individuals like Mel Tenasket, uh, my father, Andy Joseph, um, there were others, Dale Kohler, mm -hmm. they were successful oh, mm -hmm. in um, convincing others to support self-determination. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But they also tried to help shape the education of a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been doing that in your life, in your career, is helping to, to nurture young people and to, to believe in their identity, to believe in their tribal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Did you ever have chances to ever discuss education with Lucy at the American Indian Graduate Center? Well, I was on the first board of the, that um, committee, and uh, John Rayner and I r ran into each other um, with our mutual work for Indian people. And so I agreed to serve on it, and I was very happy to. And uh, we set up a s list of priorities that we wanted to um, fund. That would mean that the students uh, would have their reason in their request, you know, what they wanted to study. So education was high on the list. I think it was first on the list. And so uh, over time now, uh, that has evolved. And I know that they recently celebrated their 50th um, anniversary a while ago. And they've made a difference in the individual students who um, applied and um, it was um, really important at the time that this was done because there were very few uh, fellowships and scholarships available, especially for graduate school. And so that was important. And so she took advantage of that for her people and um, I'm, I'm not sure if that was well known enough at the time for uh, my tribal people. Um, because there were no newspapers at that time uh, in my tribe. Uh, we didn't have a tribal news newsletter or newspaper. So uh, over time though, it's uh, served thousands of young American Indian students and helped them on their way. And so of course that would be something that Lucy would um, embrace and promote. Well, you were also one of the first American Indian women to run for Congress. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, I will. Um, well, I like people and I, I like to know where the power is and Congress has a lot of power. And um, back in the 70s, I got roped into running for Secretary of State of Wisconsin and uh, the reason I got rep roped into it was the decision of uh, the staff member of the Democratic Party at that time. I was the chair of the Menominee Restoration Committee, which was the interim tribal government. After the uh, Menominee Restoration Act was passed, we had to elect an interim tribal government, and we had to um, then carry out the directives that were outlined by the Restoration Committee. We had to set up a new tribal government um, and establish a new relationship with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So <clears throat> I wanted to then uh, also work to have a Democratic Party among the Menominees because we're a Democratic tribe, uh, mm -hmm. as in the Democratic Party. and. Uh, 
that seemed to me logical. So I drove down three hours, went to the Democratic office, and the person there said, well, well we're not going to talk about uh, that. We're going to talk about you. I said, well, I don't want to talk about you. I said, I, I drove down here for th three hours, and uh, that's what I would like to do to get your information about how to establish a Democratic Party there on my reservation. And uh, she said, nope, we're not talking about that. So I said, what are we talking about then? She said, well, I think you should run for public office. I said, what? <laughs> I said, well, why? And she said, um, well, it's empty. I mean, what is it, the Secretary of State position, which is one of the constitutional officers, as it's stated in the Constitution of the uh, state of Wisconsin? And I said, why? And she said, it's empty. It's vacant. And I said, oh, that's a good reason to run for public office. So I decided, OK, I'll do this. And then I found out that I really liked to uh, meet people and to campaign. I especially liked going up to northern Wisconsin. I went up there just a few times because Wisconsin has uh, about 11 tribes. And up in northern Wisconsin, uh, Indians are not well regarded. There's a lot of racism and classism. And so I would come into various offices and I would say, hello, I'm Ada Deer and I'm running for Secretary of State. And of course, they're trying to readjust their glasses to see who is this person. So I said, I'm Ada Deer, I'm running for Secretary of State and I wanted to come up and you know talk with you about it. And most, uh, uh, most people were still trying to uh, process this because here I'm this Indian and I'm this woman and I'm running for something. They don't know what the Secretary of State does. So I told them, well, it's a constitutional office and one of the duties is to maintain the great seal of the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> and of course, I'm, I am howling to myself. And so I said, okay, I'm just here to let you know. And I didn't, I didn't win. Um, there were nine people running for that office at that time and I came in fourth in the field of nine. Well, then my campaign group said, well, you can't just run once, you have to run again. So I ran four years from there, or the next four years was the next election. So then I came in second in the field of um, uh, four, which I thought was good. And if my name had been aided dear La Follette, I would have won. The person that won was Douglas La Follette. And he's been our Secretary of State all this time. Uh, the La Follette is a very famous name in American history. He was the founder of the Progressive Party back, way back when. And um, so then uh, I said, oh, well, that was a good run. I enjoyed that. And so actually, I didn't quite understand that there would be some attention paid to, to that. But it's very hard for a woman and for a person of color to break the glass ceiling. So the next time then, my campaign troop said, well, now, not that I was directing them to do this. They called me up and they said, well, now you have to run for Congress. And I said, what? I mean, that's a really big um, step. And I wasn't so sure. But and then I started thinking about all the people I had met in Washington. And there were too many mediocre people, including many members of the Congress in the, in the Senate. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm as smart as they are. So, OK, I'll do that. So we conducted a wonderful campaign. Uh, Gloria Steinem and Wilma Mankiller came to campaign for me. Uh, Bill, Senator Bill Bradley called up and asked if he could come and, and help me. Um, Maxine Waters, the representative, came. She didn't come, but she offered her support. Uh, but I got very poor press. Um, and that was because I didn't fall into the traps that some of the media tried to get me into. They wanted me to make a comment about my campaign. Uh, the other uh, person in the uh, primary was a um, very nice and good person. Uh, uh, and he had been planning to do this for a long time. His name is David Clarenbach. And his parents were uh, intellectuals. Uh, they worked at the university. They were, I know one of them was a professor and the other one um, was very prominent in civic affairs. At any rate, um, I also did not take um, PAC money and uh, political action committee money. And I told them uh, that um, when they at, they were surprised, all kinds of people, both the Democrats and, and, and others, were, I didn't take any money from the good PACs, from 
uh, the social worker, I'm a social worker, and I'm proud of it. Uh, it has helped me uh, be the person I am today, uh, the social work profession. And we have a very low profile in the minds of the public. But if, they didn't, if we didn't have social workers, they'd have to invent them anyway. So I said, I want to be unbought and, un and unbossed. And the people would look at me with these blank stares and i say, well, that is the title of Shirley Chisholm's autobiography. Of course, that didn't mean anything to them either. And she was the, uh, the congresswoman from New York. Um, I think she was from Brooklyn. And uh, she was also, I think, from one of the, her people were from the, somewhere in the Caribbean islands. And she went on to be the uh, candidate for Congress back in, I think, um, no, president, that's what I mean, uh, in 1972, or, or about that time. And so when I told them I wanted to be unbought and unbossed, they said, oh, you know, because um, most people had PAC money, but I didn't, and I'm very proud to say that I, over the course of my campaign for Congress, I won the Democratic primary, which nobody thought I would win. And, and uh, we had a very excellent campaign going. My name is Deer, so we had buttons printed that said, I'm a deer person, and uh, nobody runs like a deer. And uh, actually, the John Deere company called up my campaign and objected. I said, well, they're the fancy deer, D-E-E-R. I'm the plain and simple deer, uh, D-E-E-R-E, -E, and I'm a, the simple deer. D-E-E-R, and of course people would laugh at that. And so I won the primary, and I collected over $500,000 from individuals, which at that time in uh, 1993 was a lot of money. Now, of course, there are millions of dollars that go into every campaign. And so I felt very proud about that. And so when I had the press conference on the election night, I said, I've been waiting all this time, all my life, to say this. And when I told my campaign troops what I was going to say, oh, you're not going to do that? Yes, I am. I said, you're the campaign troops, and I don't always have to obey what you tell me. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so they laughed and so. Okay, so what I said was, I raised my hand and I said, me nominee. <laughs> my tribe is Menominee, right? So uh, I still have people today quoting me nominee because it was a double meaning, you know? And it took a while for it to sink in at the, at the conference and they all started laughing and, and uh, it was great. So then I'm reading in the paper how Mr. Clinton wanted a government that, I didn't win the primary, okay. White guy, mm -hmm. well-educated, but he was white and he, he was a TV personality, he newscaster, and he had been doing this for several years. So he was well-known um, and so he won but uh, he didn't really do much, which is very sad. He just followed Newt Gingrich around for 12 years. I think it was 12 years. And um, now he's in private work there in uh, Wisconsin. So I'm reading in the paper how Clinton, Mr. Clinton, wanted a government that looked like America. And I said, oh, well, that's an idea. So I thought to myself, well, what, what am I saying this for? Ah, here I am. So I decided that I was going to try to be a, an assistant secretary. And I, I called up my campaign troops this time, and I said, well, get ready. I said, we're going to have a campaign for me to be assistant secretary. So there's a whole process. You have to go through a full field investigation by the FBI, and they contact your neighbors, and uh, they do all kinds of things. Well, of course, they passed that. And I did t tell uh, someone once that, um, they were in law enforcement, and I said, um, no, I'm not sure if it was in law enforcement. But anyway, some, some um, person involved in this process, I said, uh, the only thing you're gonna find on my record is speeding tickets. The world is in slow gear, and the deer is in fast gear. They didn't even laugh, they just looked at me, and I said, that's all, and I left. <laughs> that was an interesting response, <laughs> because, I think we don't laugh enough in this culture, and uh, I think humor is uh, 
a good way of expressing yourself and it also makes you feel good to smile and laugh. So then I went through the process. You have to go through the headhunters. You have to uh, have a resume. Well, I had a very strong resume, a strong leadership. I was the first woman tribal leader in my tribe. Uh, I got elected as the chair of the Menominee Restoration Committee. Um, I've been active with my profession. I was the president of the Wisconsin and National Association of Social Workers chapter. Um, I've been uh, active in uh, a lot of other organizations. And um, NARF, Native American Rights Fund, I've been on the board of NARF, and that is a really important uh, law firm based in Boulder, Colorado, that was formed almost 50 years ago now, and I think they're coming up in their 50th year. And um, they helped us a lot in our restoration struggle, provided us with wonderful legal help, uh, Professor Charles Wilkinson and Yvonne Knight. And then we had a lawyer from the OEO legal, legal program, uh, Mr. Joseph, Joseph Prelaznik from uh, Wisconsin. But the leadership came from the Menominee people. And um, when my um, uh, application for or resume f was submitted, they couldn't ignore my stellar, uh, if I'm allowed to say that, but I think it's a strong resume in many arenas. And so I got to be interviewed by um, the Secretary of HUD at that time, I think his name was Henry Gonzalez and um, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Babbitt, uh, the former governor of Arizona, and um, he, was, he selected me. So that's how I became uh, assistant secretary. But it was also the hard work of people on my campaign, you know, oh, the Democrats. That's, that's a big deal when you win the primary. And at that point, uh, until recently, uh, when the two women from this, um, let's see. Yeah, the two f current women are I Indians in, uh, well, I should say Indian women uh, got elected just recently. That was, you know, a real a victory for everybody yeah. to have them there. Well, you, you opened the door and um, to give girls a chance. Well, yeah, um, well, there are three of us now. And yeah. I'm very, very happy to say and proud that one of them, um, actually mentioned my name in some interview she was giving and I, th I was uh, very happy to, to know that. See, most of us who are doing things, we try to keep track of each other and who's doing what and so on. And so um, there are three of us that actually you know, won the primaries and they won the general election. Yeah. Of course, they had a bigger um, voting population, in, one in New Mexico and uh, the other one from Kansas. So and then I became the assistant secretary. The first woman, people always want to say Indians. I said, well, yes, but I was the first woman to be elected or to be selected as assistant secretary. Yes, I'm proud of my Indian heritage, but uh, I, I claim a lot of women's um, identification also because I am a woman and I was very active in a number of women's activities. And so that's the, uh, one of the other big um, groups that um, I was uh, noted for. Well, Lucy Covington had been successful by 1970 mm -hmm. in changing the dynamics of the tribal government. Mm -hmm. um, she was uh, able to convince members of Congress, and I know you had to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what skills those are that you need to, to have to convince members of Congress to mm -hmm. change federal policy? Mm -hmm. Well, it helps to have a good education. And I have a wonderful education, a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's degree in social work from the <coughs> Columbia University School of Social Work. Plus, I think I was born a loudmouth and a, an inquisitive person. And uh, my mother, uh, was a Quaker, and she didn't really specify that um, a lot, 
but she just practiced her um, Quaker values. And uh, she told me when I was under um, 10 that, Ada dear, you're an Indian. I said, well, okay, mom. And because I was very obedient with her because she treated me, always treated me as an adult and as an individual. There were five of us and that's what she did with all of, my, all of us. Um, she said, you're an Indian and you were put on the earth for a purpose and you, you are to help your people. So I didn't quite know what she meant, but I learned the word help and we social workers always use the word help. So I, that, that came later. Um, Help was not a foreign concept to me because I was already helping. You know, I lived in a one-room log cabin on the banks of the beautiful Wolf River, which is a wild and scenic river as specified by the government. And uh, we had a one-room log cabin, no indoor water, no electricity, no computers, <laughs> no cell phones. And when I tell, tell my students this at the university, I. I was recruited by the chancellor of the university to come down and join the, the faculty there. Um, he said, I said, I don't understand this. I said, because I don't have a PhD. At that point, I didn't know what the bureaucracy of the university was. And this was when I was the chair of the restoration committee. And he said, well, we need, I don't have a PhD. And he said, well, we need all kinds of people at the university. I said, what I have is a terminal degree at that time a master's degree, and I'm busy doing something about the problems in society. So having a strong value system and a good sense of social justice was really important because I um, went to Washington uh, at that point in time. It was important to be a person from the tribe Right now, there are way too many high-priced lobbyists that make $400 an hour as a base, and they're usually white people. I have nothing against white people. My mother was white, my father was Indian, and I claim both heritages. Um, but you have to have your goals and your um, determination, um, and you have to be uh, aware uh, and knowledgeable about l how the process works and you can't give up because somebody says no. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, it would take a longer time, but I'll just try to drill down. When I found out that our tribal people were protesting and I, I worked at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, which was about two hours from our reservation, I. Uh, I thought, wow, they're protesting. Well, then I read again that they were protesting, and I thought, well, I have to go and find out about this. My curiosity got the best of me. So I go up there and I say, well, what, what's going on here? And why are you doing this? Well, they said, they're selling our land. Selling our land, oh, it just struck me up, my heart. Selling our beautiful reservation. Now, in the treaty process, we had signed a treaties. Now, of course, uh, people, were not knowledgeable uh, in English, and so they, they made a mark, and then that was verified by the, um, I guess it was the um, interpreters or maybe the federal government people that were involved in this. So we gave away and ceded to the federal government millions of acres, as many tribes have. And I thought, well, we were supposed to have our current reservation as a homeland. And I thought, well, I'm not putting up with this. So I didn't know, I, so I talked to people there, uh, but they had been working on this for a while. And then uh, I, I went and I said, well, okay, I'm gonna go and find a lawyer. So I went and found the director of Wisconsin Judicare. And he looked at me sort of skepti skeptically. He said, well, I explained what I wanted. I said, I need to know more about termination. And he said, well, all kinds of, no. He said, a number of Menominees have come to him because they were really suffering. The termination uh, took away our, the hospital. We were under state control. So we went from the federal government to the state. And our people were 
bereft and saddened. And I remember one gentleman who lived in Zor, his name was Johnson Awanape, said that uh, when I visited him and talked about working against termination, that one day he's an Indian and the next day he's not, but he said, I'm still me. And I th thought that was a very profound statement for him to make at that time, especially since he didn't really know me. I've been away from the reservation since I was 18. And um, I'd gone off to graduate school, and I had worked in, in Minneapolis, and then I came to Stevens Point. And then that's how I got involved in the early 70s with uh, my people, because I'm remembering what my mother told me. I said, well, this is it. I'd been wanting to go to law school for about 10 years. And I decided it was more important for me to help my people than to uh, go to law school. I could always go to law school. And so uh, you have to have a clear vision of what you want. And you cannot be discouraged by uninformed people or people that are opposed to what you're trying to do. This country still doesn't know what to do uh, about Indians and other people of color. Uh, they're not doing right by us in general. If you look at the history of Indian affairs in this country, it's very sad. And only in, since the 70s has it really begun to change with self-determination and um, other more positive um, policies. It was initiated under President Kennedy. And then when he was um, assassinated, then President Johnson took up the war on poverty. And I say it was the so-called war, but it was a skirmish. <laughs> and we, the American people, uh, didn't win the skirmish. Um, there are at least two programs from the OEO program. One is legal service that survived. One is the, o the legal services program, and the other one is Head Start. So those are very positive programs for the American people. So um, I also had an open mind, and I appealed to, to the people that were involved in all of this. Uh, for example, uh, our people in Milwaukee formed a, a group. Uh, well, we decided also we had to form a, a form a group name, develop a group name. And so um, my sister Connie Deer, who's uh, who was a younger person at that point, I think she was still in college, but she became a nurse and a lawyer. And uh, she helped us. And we were sitting around one day, uh, people on the reservation. Um, and also we had a, a drums group in Chicago. And we hadn't invented the word yet. At any rate, we were having uh, this discussion and I said, we need to have a name for our group. It has to have the word Menominee in it and has to have something about our struggle. So my sister, who is a very brilliant person, said, well, and she was kind of noodling around on paper, and so she came up with drums. I said, drums? Wow, that's a really wonderful name. So I said, now, what do you, spell it out. So she said, determination of rights and unity for Menominee shareholders. And so it's a very famous name now in Indian um, policy circles because uh, it started as a grassroots effort of the Menominee people. We had uh, the chair of the Chicago chair, Jim White, and we had the Milwaukee chair, Lloyd Paulus. And then we had um, Laurel Otradovic, who was the chair of the Menominee group. And they, they all worked hard to advance this. We had meetings and we had a lot of resistance from some of the people on our reservation because they said, that, well, it's a federal law and we have to obey the law. But then we all said, well, it's the wrong law. It's not right. We're losing our land. We're losing our people and it's, it's terrible. All right, so then we, uh, we took over, it's, it's a long story, and so I just will summarize that um, there, was a, there were two trusts. There were two entities that were formed, and they had some power. 
The Menominees were at the bottom. We were, we had, we were certificate holders in this state corporation. It was called Menominee Enterprises, Inc. It went from a federally recognized tribal government to a state corporation. And people didn't understand that. And so we, we just had very little power at that point. And so we decided uh, at the suggestion and the advice of our Wisconsin lawyer, we could have proxies and we could have a vote. And so two of us drums people got elected to the voting trust. But uh, it was still a struggle because um, we, we marched from our village in Kashina up to what was one of our most famous lakes, Legend Lake. And uh, at that point in time, uh, before termination, we were allowed, we, no, the common practice was for uh, people, if you wanted to hunt and fish, and you could do it, and you didn't need permission from anybody. Well, after termination, uh, uh, that changed, and white people started coming, and uh, they started selling the land, and they started to not allow the Menominees to go to one of the most and easiest uh, lakes, easiest to get to lakes, which really incensed people because we were accustomed to uh, respecting the land and to um, do with, um, uh, well, it, to do what we wanted and where we wanted. So at that point in 1954, when the Termination Act was passed, there were 3,270 people in a tribal role. So it was a small population. And the, and the land um, and the waters and the lakes and so on were um, available to everybody at any time. Well, then all of this um, jurisdiction of the state and the corporations really um, harmed our people. Uh, the first thing they did was install a white superintendent to manage the tribal mill and he immediately um, fired 150 men. So that was 150 families. So they, there was no jobs. People had to leave. They went to Milwaukee, they went to Chicago, they went to other places. And, um, but they always kept track of each other through what we call the moccasin telegraph because the ties of people were very strong to the land and to their relatives on the reservation. So I know I'm telling you more than you expected, but you have to have a background of some of this. And so we got inspired by our victory uh, in taking and getting elected to the voting trust. And one of the first things was to have a meeting. Well, they had a meeting. And so two of us got a, uh, came from the drums group, myself and uh, Georgiana um, Webster Ignace. And um, well, the first thing the tribal chair, no, not the tribal chair, the trustee chair said, well, we have to sell some land. And I'm sitting there thinking, sell the land? And they're all sitting there like this. No, there were other Menominees on this, but they, they didn't have my education. And they also didn't have inquiring minds want to know. So, so I raised my hand and I said, they, they were not happy that the drums people got elected because we were only two people out of, I don't know, maybe nine or so. I, don't, I can't remember the exact number. But anyway, um, I said, well, why are we talking about selling the land? Well, the state of Wisconsin wants to establish an uh, environmental office up here. So I said, well, I don't know about the rest of you. I do not agree with selling one more inch of our tribal land. And I don't approve of it. And you other Menominees should not be agreeing to this either in this tone. I can still fear myself speaking. Now, they were not accustomed to a woman, and much less a much younger woman, telling the trustees what to do. And um, so, the chair had daughters my age, and I used to go to his house and, and talk with his daughters and so on. And so um, he said, well, we could, uh, let's just table this. And I said, well, there has to be some other way other than selling the land. Now, uh, I'm a loudmouth, as you can see. And so the next time we had a meeting, he said, well, we can lease the land. Well, 
That's not selling it, it's leasing it, right? Right, okay, so that's what happened. So you have to speak up, you have to speak out, you have to confront, and you can't give up. So you asked me the skills about all this. You have to have the, the background, and I loved our land, I love our tribe, not every single member of the tribe, but the tribe, and we're a very famous tribe now. We went from termination to restoration, and that is the, uh, one of the first times, I think it might, might, might even be the first, that a very small tribe got the U.S. government to reverse this major policy. And so in legal circles, political science circles, sociological circles, this is uh, well known and uh, well respected that the Menominees stood up for their land and their people, and we have a book called uh, Freedom with Reservation, the Menominee struggle to save their land and people. Most people want to know what is the Indian problem, like there's only one Indian and only one problem, and that's of course not true, but it's always about land and people. And um, along the way, to continue just briefly on the, there were lots of congressmen and senators that were for this. Congressman um, David Obi from our tribe, uh, from our Wisconsin, he represented the, our area, and uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson, the father of Earth Day, Senator William Proxmire, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, some people in Milwaukee had contacts with his office. We went down there, met with him, uh, and uh, other than being awed, uh, I thought, well, this is great. And so I was waiting for somebody to say something. Well, they were a little ill at ease, but then we started talking, and so then I said, oh, well, I'd like to explain why we're here. And I told Senator Ted Kennedy at that time that we were terminated, we wanted to reverse the policy, we were losing our land, losing our people. And uh, he said, well, when you get to Washington, you know, come, come to my office. So uh, in general, we had a lot of support in the Congress. We had uh, uh, people that I could name, but I'm getting the signal here. <laughs> and we have, to, we have to stop. But um, again, it's a very historic reversal of um, a governmental policy, and this proves to everybody that you can work through the system, you're persistent and determined, and you mobilize, and uh, don't give up. Well, thank you for all those details, Ada. I, um, um, we've got plenty for the Lucy Covington Project but I know they need to ask you some questions for the American Indian Hall of Fame. But okay. Thank you for all those great mm -hmm. details. Well, thank you for asking. As you can see, I have a lot to say. <laughs>